This is Nalan Gupta of the Departments of Neurological Surgery and Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. I will be speaking about the features and treatment of myelomeningocele. The content of this presentation does not relate to any product of a commercial entity, therefore I have no relationships to report. So why is this topic interesting? Spinal dysraphism is the broader condition that refers to all congenital anomalies of the nervous system and spinal formation that are related to failure of closure uh, or normal formation of the neural tube. This condition is common in 1 in 2,000 live births, and from a biologic perspective, it is a window into neurulation, and we will be discussing that the definition of that in a moment. Uh, neurulation is the formation of the neural tube and, by extension, the central nervous system. The nomenclature of these broader group of conditions is, is confusing. In general terms, uh, there can be a, a separation by etiology in terms of neural tube defects, those that are caused by failures of primary neurulation versus those that are caused by failure of secondary neurulation. Historically, spinal dysphrasivism was uh, viewed in two broad categories, and this still has practical utility because the commonest form, myelomeningocele, is a form of spina bifida aperta, or open spina bifida, and this generally has the more severe clinical phenotype, whereas the spina bifida occulta, or closed spina bifida, while still um, representing certain complex conditions, generally tend to have uh, a fewer or more milder uh, phenotype than myelomeningocele. The embryology of these conditions is fascinating as it uh, really harks back to neurulation, which is a very early step in uh, development. Neurulation is the process of infolding of the neural plate to form the neural tube, and it involves uh, discrete steps such as the formation and shaping of the plate, bending and elevation of the plate, its adhesion and fusion of the folds, and then finally separation from the overlying ectoderm. This process occurs in general between the third and fourth week after fertilization. Uh, of note, it is felt that the caudal segments of the spinal cord, S234, form by a separate or parallel process of secondary neurulation that is less well defined. This uh, figure describes the steps that I just uh, mentioned in which the neural plate is patterned and the cells as they change shape uh, form a tubular structure that then has to separate from the overlying ectoderm with interposition of mesodermal components within that space. And, and those mesodermal components are what ultimately give rise to the structures such as the spinous processes and the paraspinal muscles. An additional form of, uh, of classification is, a, is one that directly refers to the abnormalities at, uh, related to steps in embryogenesis, and this is a useful way of thinking of these. Today we'll be speaking mostly about anomalies of primary neurulation myelomeningocele. There are others that fall mostly into the category of the closed types of defects, and these relate to failures of disjunction secondary neurulation or post-neurulation development. And we will not be speaking uh, about these uh, abnormalities in much detail today. I just show this slide to show you the variety of cutaneous anomalies that can arise in closed forms of spina bifida, and these include hemangioma, appendages, hairy patches, midline dimples, and subcutaneous lipomas. This is a typical myelomeningocele. One sees a newborn with a sac that is visible in the lower back. The uh, plaque coat in the center appears as a reddish tissue surrounded by varying degrees of epithelialized arachnoid and other attenuated tissue. We can see that the legs are affected. There um, is a presence of club feet, and there is marked uh, wasting of the muscles of the, of the lower extremities, in particular below the knees. Myelomeningocele is the commonest of neural tube defects. Uh, of note, the incidence has fallen by 50% in the last 20 years, and it is felt that this is in part related to folic acid prophylaxis, although this does not uh, explain the full clinical uh, uh, response or change over time. Uh, it should be important, and, uh, or it is important and, and to recognize that the visible defect that we saw in the illustration or photograph is only one aspect of the entire spectrum of the problem. The treatment of this condition is really directed towards, the, uh, at, at the outset, the repair of the uh, skin and closure of the skin, and the objective of that is to prevent infection. Uh, 
the postnatal repair is not designed to restore anatomic function and it is not expected to restore neurologic function. It is also important to identify and treat the associated abnormalities. This figure is just to remind us that the, even though the abnormality is occurring in, in the lower, often in the lower part of the spine, in this case we can see that there are a number of associated intracranial abnormalities. This is a typical Chiari 2 malformation, and one can see the descent of the cerebellar tonsils into the upper cervical spine. Posterior fossa is also small, and there are other abnormalities in the brain um, above this uh, uh, small hindbrain. The uh, associated central nervous system anomalies are related to the malformation of the spinal cord that has an impact on lower extremity function and urologic function. There are also cranial abnormalities such as hydrocephalus, the Chiari malformation that we discussed, and structural abnormalities such as brainstem anomalies uh, such as a medullary kink uh, and disorganization of brainstem structures. There can also be agenesis of the corpus callosum and migrational anomalies in the brain. There are also other systems that are affected. Orthopedic uh, conditions as a result of the neuromuscular abnormality can result in club feet, dislocated hips, and later spinal deformities. I mentioned urologic dysfunction, but this can occur both uh, at birth and can progress later in life to involve varying degrees of lack of continence and ultimately renal failure if untreated. Patients can have significant cognitive and behavioral uh, disturbances as a result of both their chronic uh, illness and, and multiple uh, interventions from a healthcare perspective. It is important to note that uh, the extent of disability is substantial, and while not each uh, patient has every one of these, um, many patients can have several that are have a substantial impact on their quality of life, and these include uh, requirements for a wheelchair, presence of hydrocephalus, spinal deformity, orthopedic issues, and others that, that we've discussed. I will mention just a couple of historical papers that have outlined the impact of this condition on patients. This is a paper from the Hospital for Sick Children that followed a number of patients, almost 200 over a period of time. And of these patients during that study period, almost 15 patients died, uh, 13 from shunt complications, which is a substantial uh, burden of, of uh, mortality for this diagnosis. In this paper, 45 patients with myelomingocil were followed, and these patients uh, required surgical intervention for a tethered spinal cord at a fairly high rate in the first several years of life. Finally, in these older papers, the life expectancy was calculated, and there was a surprisingly uh, high impact or large impact on survival for both of these cohorts of patients. Uh, often as a consequence of uh, the uh, chronic impact of uh, the underlying disease. So the issue really is that this is a, even though this condition is, is amenable to surgical repair after birth and uh, these patients often will uh, initially do well, there is a substantial burden of disease. And the question is, is can these primary or secondary abnormalities be prevented? Can this disability be reduced? And the other uh, longstanding or long-term question is whether these functional pathways are preserved and whether they can be augmented. So the work that I'm going to describe has been published, and this paper was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine that described the results of a randomized uh, prospective trial examining prenatal and postnatal repair of myelomeningocele. This was made possible because Mid-gestational diagnosis of this condition is facilitated by both ultrasound and fetal MRI scans, and this allows us through early diagnosis to implement certain surgical strategies to access these lesions. A great deal of work has been done over many years to develop the techniques for safe access to the maternal gravid uterus, and uh, we will not be going over those steps today. Briefly, this uh, montage of images show uh, examples of a, a fetal myelomeningocele of different types. The uterus is, in this case, um, um, opened, and that hysterotomy is allowed, uh, is used to access the visible part of the, of the fetus. In general, the size of the hysterotomy is minimized to prevent uh, some of the complications associated with this procedure, in particular the maternal complications. Direct access to this defect allows us to perform a surgical repair that is fundamentally very similar to what is done in the postnatal setting. There are some differences which have been described in other uh, papers and 
um, areas, but briefly, the uh, placoda separated from the surrounding epithelium and closed, and then the um, layers of both the dura and the skin are brought over to, to achieve a, a closure. And in this case, we're seeing a still image of uh, a closed uh, defect. And then after this, the hysterotomy will be closed and the maternal abdomen also uh, uh, closed. The results from the MOM study is that uh, prenatal surgery for myelomeningus still reduces uh, the need for a shunt or death and improves motor function at 30 months, but there are clear maternal and fetal risks. There are also other favorable secondary outcomes. Uh, there's reduced hindbrain herniation. Uh, the number of patients that were able to walk with orthotics was doubled from 42% to 21%, and more were uh, likely to have a level of function that was two or more levels better than expected, 32% versus 12%. Some of these improvements in function may be related to the fact that chronic exposure of the plaque code to the amniotic fluid may result in, in a delayed deterioration of function within the plaque code. The primary outcome in this case was uh, shunt placement, and for this particular criteria, there is a statistically significant difference between those patients that uh, had prenatal versus postnatal closure, and the primary outcome was uh, determined by pre-specified criteria by a uh, blinded group of investigators who examined patients imaging studies and determined whether they met shunt criteria or not. Of note, um, the actual placement of a shunt was reduced in both groups, 40% um, compared to 82%, and that was also statistically significant. As uh, we have noted, the impact on hindbrain herniation was significant. The uh, number of patients in the prenatal group that had none or mild carry malformation uh, was almost 80%, whereas it was only 30% uh, in the postnatal group. The majority of patients in the postnatal group had severe uh, hindbrain herniation. This is an illustration of a patient that was imaged uh, by a fetal MRI scan showing uh, somewhat indistinct but clear signs of a CRI2 malformation in utero, and then a subsequent postnatal scan showing um, virtually complete resolution of the CRI2 malformation and a normal configuration of the brainstem and cerebellum. In terms of functional outcomes, uh, when the two groups were compared, double, approximately 42% of those in the prenatal group were able to walk independently. And I should note that uh, these outcomes were measured at 30 months of age uh, compared to the postnatal group. So in, in closure, um, was the MOM study a useful study? It uh, clearly allowed us to examine what the impact of mid-gestational closure uh, was on, sec on some of the secondary features associated with spina bifida, it, and in this way it led to a deeper understanding for CNS development. Uh, it is a laboratory for technical advances, and although we have not discussed this today, further uh, approaches using endoscopic te techniques have markedly reduced the rates of maternal uh, complication associated with this procedure. The other opportunity it provides us is a platform for future studies that will hopefully incorporate structural augmentation using either cell-based therapies or other innovative therapies. Some of the lessons learned are that CNS development is more plastic. Uh, some of the changes that we believe to be fixed and in the postnatal setting are clearly reversible, such as the uh, carry malformation. In addition, there may be more potential function available in the placode than has been uh, previously appreciated. Uh, and our conclusion is that prenatal intervention can reverse some of these uh, CNS abnormalities. However, uh, this should be balanced against the fact that the cost of fetal intervention is substantial with respect to both fetal and maternal risks, and these should be weighed carefully when patients, uh, mothers are being considered for possible fetal intervention. The maternal risk, which is the natural history risk and disease risk, uh, should be examined carefully. 